today. Um, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for attending today's Nadia Division Three Commissioner Association Regional Officiating Webinar. Uh, special thanks to um, uh, Nadia for hosting us today. Just uh, a little background. My name is Patrick Summers. I'm the Executive Director of the NUMAC and I'm also the Chair of the, uh, the Officiating Committee um, that's been uh, working with the Pictor Group on this. Um, our process over this week is to host six regional seminars um, to review the report, a strategic analysis of the state of collegiate officiating. Uh, and that was based on work that we did in 2018, 2019 uh, with the Pictor Group. Um, and we had conducted um, a great deal amount of uh, surveys, uh, uh, constituency meetings um, and uh, the result is what you're gonna see today. Uh, we're specifically doing it regionally so you can see the data that applies to your institutions and conferences. Um, and um, I'd like to introduce the, the members of the Pictor Group who are um, gonna present uh, this session today. So if you could raise your hands as I call your name, Carolyn Schlesemovich, um, Sandy Hatfield Club, and Mary Struckoff. And additionally, from the officiating committee, we have Kerry Wachowski, who the commissioner of the North Coast Athletic Conference as well, who is with us. Um, from a Zoom etiquette perspective today, we ask that you all uh, mute your microphones, um, use their ha uh, raise hand feature and we'll call on you uh, to speak. Uh, you can also use the chat feature um, in terms of uh, asking us questions uh, and either Carrie and I will call as well, uh, we'll call on you. Oop, Dee Abrahamson has also joined us from the Picture Group and uh, we'd also like to welcome Lori Runksmeyer, our president of Nadia as well for joining us. So um, as we move forward, um, uh, one more thing I'd like you all to put down if you could, December 15th from one to 2 p.m. Eastern time, we'll be hosting a follow-up to these regional webinars and we'll be starting to talk a little bit more about the strategic plan which is the next step of uh, the, the officiating project that we're working on. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Carolyn um, to start us off. So Carolyn, all yours. Good morning or good afternoon to all. I think, well, I, I think it's still morning in most places, but uh, uh, it's our privilege to um, work with the uh, Division Three Commissioners Association on behalf of uh, all of you and your memberships. Um, uh, to do this strategic analysis of collegiate officiating. As Patrick indicated, we began our work um, last August in earnest, and uh, we have been working feverishly, feverishly since then. Um, and today we're going to be talking with you about phase one of the work that we've been doing for the Collegiate Commissioners Association, um, which includes the uh, data collection analysis and share with you data that is very specific to institutions, membership, and officiating in the Great Lakes region. Um, this slide um, just uh, gives you some indication of the good guidance that we received uh, throughout the course of the year. This was the Officiating Steering Committee, um, 10 different commissioners from across the country representing all regions uh, to make sure that we were very comprehensive and thorough in our analysis and obviously gave us great insights and guidance into the data collection um, and analysis phase of this work. Next slide, please. And so the scope of the project um, initially started with 13 sports and was expanded to 15 sports that you see listed here. Um, this was largely because um, once we got underway with our work for the Division Three Commissioners Association, the NCAA asked us to expand the scope of work um, to include data analysis for Divisions 1, 2, as well as Division Three, and asked us to add several more sports. So uh, we were obviously pleased to do that. And the 15 sports there um, really gives you some indication of the breadth of the work. So not only were we looking at uh, officiating across all regions, but also across 15 different sports. The um, engagement in this process was quite extensive. Um, you see here on the slide, the number of stakeholders, the different, number, the different types of stakeholders, but also the total number of over 15,000 individuals contributed 
either be via survey, focus groups, interviews, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and so forth. And of course, your coordinators and assigners were a big part of that. Your commissioners were a huge part of that. Um, but most importantly, we had over 10,000 officials, division one, two, and three officials that participated. Um, one of the key elements that we added uh, once we got into the project um, was some survey work with head coaches because we really felt it was essential that uh, we hear from the head coaches with respect to all of the issues around officiating. So over 15,000 people participated, very broad, very comprehensive. And from that, we have received a tremendous amount of data um, that will help direct us in our next phase, which is the strategic planning phase. But here today, we're gonna to talk with you about data that's specific to the Great Lakes region, um, critical issues facing officiating. And with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Sandy Hatfield Club. Thank you, Carolyn, and greetings, everyone. Uh, good to be with you today, and very excited to share with you uh, what we learned through this data collection process about officiating, um, specifically to focus on the Great Lakes for you today. Um, all stakeholders were in agreement that there are two critical issues facing officiating. Of course, this is no surprise to to everybody. One is the pipeline of officials and two is the availability of quality officials. So let's drive down just a little bit deeper on this from a general division three perspective, uh, not yet looking at the regionality. Um, number one is that we learned 79% of all division three officials begin their officiating career either at the high school and or youth level. So we said what's happening at that level we learned from 2020 officially human data that 50% of high school officials are over the age of 50 and 45% of them are within six years of retiring. Uh, we also learned from the NASO data in 2017 that the average age of youth officials in the 15 sports that we studied is 53 years of age. So how long does it take for an official to get from the entry level in the sport to the NCAA, the average across all sports for division three is eight years. What's the mean age of all NCAA division three officials is just under the age of 49. And lastly, we learned that uh, from a, a pipeline perspective, 80% of all division three officials are Caucasian or white and 85% of them are male. What about the availability of officials? We asked the question of uh, two coordinators, conference coordinators, did, in the last season, uh, what sports did you have to move or contests did you have to move simply because there were not enough available qualified officials? The contest was scheduled, the student athletes and coaches are ready and aim for that, but we don't have enough officiating, we have to change the date. And that was true in 12 different Division III sports across the nation. We'll drive down in just a minute on the Great Lakes. There were three sports across all divisions in the NCAA that had to move contests at least once during the last full season. And that was women's lacrosse, men's and women's tennis, and men's and women's swimming and diving. So then we asked officials, what are the most critical issues for you? And these are the four issues that they brought up. And it, this was true across all three divisions. And this is the data specifically from the 6,800 officials that identified themselves as officiating in division three. Number one is fees, not keeping pace with demands of the job. Secondly, assigning strongholds, creating advancement barriers. Three is poor sportsmanship and treatment of officials affecting uh, uh, retention and then recruiting new officials into officiating. Uh, this particular question, they had about a dozen issues to choose from. These four stood out far and away from the rest as the ones that were most critical in this particular order. So I'm going to drive down now for you on a regional perspective. And first, I want to orient you to how the regions were broken up for this particular report. Doesn't exactly mirror the Division Three regions, so uh, work with us. But we wanted you to know what we're talking about when we talk about the data. Right now, we are looking at the Great Lakes. As you can see, 19% of the 6,800 officials 
were in the Great Lakes region. They were only permitted to choose one region. They may work across regions, but they were asked to select the region for which they received the majority of their assignments. So in the question, when we asked in the most recent full season to the coordinators, how often was it necessary to have institutional personnel reschedule a contest, specifically in the Great Lakes, these are the seven sports that were identified by 71 Division III coordinators in the Great Lakes as having to be moved at least once in the last season. So field hockey, women's gymnastics, women's lacrosse, men's women's soccer, softball, women's volleyball and men's water polo. On the left side there are the 12 sports that were identified nationally. The three in red are the three that are across all divisions. Next, I'm gonna take you into uh, the age by gender. So it's important to know that these percentages are the percentage of that particular gender. There are out of, um, all Division Three officials identifying themselves as the Great Lakes region, 87% of them were male, 12% were female. Uh, you can see that doesn't measure up to 100%. There was another um, category I prefer not to say, which was less than 1%, so it's not identified here. I do want to give a little disclaimer as you listen to the data presentation. Um, you'll note in a couple of areas, things don't always add up perfectly. There might be one off or so. That has to do with either a rounding error or, for example, in this particular category, we didn't want to um, have too much on this slide for you and include a category that, that um, is not as significant. So uh, the mean age of NCA Division III officials, as a reminder, is 49. Specifically in the Great Lakes, you can see that 29% of all female officials identifying themselves in the Great Lakes are in the 55 to 64 category. And the highest percentage for men, you, you see, are in the 45 to 54 per, uh, cate age category at 26%. This next slide shows you race by gender. So again, you can see at the bottom there, 87% are male, 12% are female. And this is the percentage of those, those genders in those particular race categories. You can see that the 80% um, is the average of division three officials that were Caucasian, identified themselves as Caucasian or white and 87% uh, of male officials in the Great Lakes region identified themselves as Caucasian or white. 83% of the female officials in the Great Lakes identified themselves as Caucasian or white. And you can see there lastly in the orange slide, a uh, little square at the top, 85% were male, um, a little bit higher in the Great Lakes region with 87% male officials. With that, I'm going to turn it now over to my colleague, Mary Struckoff. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, the next uh, pieces of data we're going to look at are um, regarding entry and retention of officials, specifically in the Great Lakes region. Um, this particular slide is, if, as, you, as you recall, Sandy mentioned that 79%, and it's in there, 79% of D3 officials began fishing it at the high school level or at the youth level. And basically, these three columns represent those areas. So it just breaks it down by sport within the Great Lakes region. The higher the percentage obviously means, and these are all the highest percentages for those particular sports, but men's ice hockey, for instance, at 92%, the vast majority of the men's ice hockey officials were beginning at the youth level. Um, any number that's probably below 50% or 40% means it was spread across all the different categories um, for beginning entry points of officiating. And those other entry points that aren't listed there because the numbers were so low might be at the intercollegiate um, level, could be at um, intramurals within intercollegiate, could be at the professional or Olympic level. Um, all of those were listed. And again, the numbers were very small. Um, what's important about this information is again, it helps us with recruiting down the road. And, and we're gonna specifically look at this within your region for the strategic planning as we look at recruiting and where we can identify officials, uh, especially large numbers um, of officials. 
It's also important to know that as we delve deeper uh, with, within the data by region and then by sport, some of those numbers got fairly small. So you see the little disclaimer at the bottom, um, the highest percentage were listed by sport, but also if there were fewer than 10 respondents per sport, when we delve deeper by uh, region, we just didn't list it because it, it became not as significant as, as the other data. I also just, sorry to jump in Mary, but wanted to share that we are going to slide, share our slide deck with you following this presentation. And we do have much of this data drilled down by region and sport for you. Exactly. Yeah, some of the slides we, we hid just for purposes of uh, keeping things moving. So you can get that when you get the slide deck later. Uh, this particular slide talks about um, officials experience. And again, what's important about this slide, and you see that we sorted it um, in order in the very last column, that's the average amount of time. And again, Sandy mentioned in the opening slides that it, it takes on average eight years for an official to start and enter the avocation of officiating. It takes them eight years to get to the NCA level and likely the division three level because that's the entry point for many uh, officials as they, they get into NCA officiating. So eight years is the average. What's important about that last column is some of these sports, it takes obviously longer since eight is the average and some take fewer. Look at the sports listed on the left side. You'll see a lot of the women's sports near the bottom of that list and that with a less than at the eight year average um, time it takes to get into those sports at the NCA level. And again, that's likely due to trying to diversify the population, especially get, getting more women into the avocation. As we know, those numbers are, are smaller uh, as Sandy mentioned earlier. Um, sports like baseball and softball takes 13, 12 years to get into it, even after they start at that entry level, it might be high school, it might be youth. Again, that's a long time to wait for a lot of officials. It definitely impacts our recruiting effort, but it also impacts retention efforts. If people feel like it takes too long, um, we know experience is a big important part of officiating, but again, in terms of retention, if they just feel like there's no pathway to get to the NCA. They, they may in fact give up trying. The next slide again talks about really our competition at the division three level. This slide is um, specific to the Great Lakes region. And you'll see again, Sandy mentioned that our biggest, our biggest competitor is high school. And that's true across every single section or region, except for the West, which is really interesting. The biggest competitor in the West is the junior college level. So that, um, that bar would be higher than the high school level in the West. So this is pretty typical across the country. 77% of division three officials in the Great Lakes are also working at least some contests at the high school level. But if you look at the junior college and NAIA influence, it's still pretty significant. Um, and again, in terms of fees and what we're expecting of our officials in terms of travel, um, they may in fact choose to stay closer to home with a junior college game or an NAIA game if that happens to be, with, again, within their neighborhood or within a, a shorter distance than perhaps some of the D Division three contests um, that they have to officiate. So this, again, is a good indication of our co competition, whether it be just in time and officiating or could be in fees, just there, there could be other things involved. It's important to note, too, that where it says professional and Olympic level, we don't anticipate that 15% are working in the professional ranks. That's likely kind of an NGB um, competition for us, especially in sports like volleyball or soccer. They may be um, classifying that as an Olympic if, if it's if considered USA volleyball or USA swimming or whatever it might be in that case. All right. This is, a, this is an interesting thing in terms of compensation, which is important to all athletic administrators and commissioners. Um, this question just really uh, delved a little bit deeper into how satisfied are you as an official with the compensation you receive um, at the Division Three level? This was specific to Division Three. You'll see here that the average for all Division Three officials was uh, almost 41% indicated they were satisfied. Uh, the Great Lakes region specifically was just over that average, uh, which is a good thing. It's always better to be on above the average than below. 
Um, but what's interesting about this data is, again, if you look at the bigger picture, and I'm just going to pick on the South because of the number there at 33%, but at 33%, that obviously means two out of three officials in the South are not satisfied with their compensation. So we almost have to look at the negative on this one uh, just to see um, you know, what it's really telling us in terms of what our population of officials is telling us. Um, if you look at the, the sports specifically, which again, you'll have on your slide deck when you get that, the most satisfied sports within the Great Lakes region were track and field at 75%, swimming and diving at 72, women's soccer at 63, women's volleyball at 51. I'm gonna stop there, but the least satisfied officials within the Great Lakes region um, by sport were men's ice hockey at 8%, men's basketball at 22%, women's gymnastics at 24, football at 30, and baseball at 32. So again, these are this information is gonna be really important to us as we delve a little deeper by sport, by region, and start developing that strategic plan um, as it pertains to uh, really retention, which is what this amounts to. You can go to the next slide, Sandy. And again, one of the, another big issue for officials about it, regarding retention is the assigning process. Officials like to work. All the data lends itself to uh, they want to work more. They don't want to work less. They want, they want important games. They want to know that they're doing a good job. And officials um, just, again, like to know that where they stand in terms of the amount and number of contests they're going to get in, in their officiating season. So this particular question asks them, do you feel, um, what level of agreement do you have uh, that the assigning process that is used by your coordinators and assigners is fair? So again, the average for all of division three was about 66%, which seems to be a good number, but that also means one in three division three officials felt like it wasn't fair. Um, that's significant. Uh, the Great Lakes region was right about that average at 65%. And again, if we look at the specific sports, um, who thinks it's fair? And again, we know that there's a lot of complexity with whether they believe it's fair or not. But the, the, the higher numbers for fairness were in field hockey, women's soccer, women's gymnastics, women's ice hockey. The smaller numbers, uh, the lower percentages for fairness in sports in the Great Lakes region were women's water polo. The, the number was small there, obviously. Men's volleyball, swimming and diving, men's lacrosse, track and field, and women's volleyball. All right, the next one again is um, about education and training. Obviously, this is for beginning officials at the NCAA level, but also continuing education throughout. Um, how, how effective did they feel like the education and training that was available to them was? And again, a little bit higher here than the fairness question. Uh, the division three average was just over 71%. The Great Lakes fell just slightly below that. Um, but again, when the numbers are, are fairly tight, like they were here, it's important to look at the sports. Football, softball, men's and women's basketball, and baseball, not surprisingly, were near the top of the satisfaction um, or the effectiveness ratings for education and training. Those near the bottom of effective education and training were men's ice hockey, swimming and diving, field hockey, track and field, and wrestling. And again, you'll, you'll see those in the slide decks that you get. Um, well, you see it right there? Oh, you get to see it right now because I didn't hide it. <laughs> That's okay. It's not a secret. Um, this next slide really, again, is important in terms of retention for officials. Not only do they want assignments, they want to know how well they're doing in those assignments. They would like feedback. And feedback for, for officials is important when it's, um, when it's neutral, if at all possible. Um, so coordinators and assigners in many cases are asked by virtue of their contracts uh, with, their, with your conferences to, to do some performance feedback. This particular um, slide is talking about, and again, you see it's not a true percentage of satisfied or not satisfied, but it, it, the blue indicates they, they mentioned that they were frequently or occasionally um, evaluated by their coordinators and, or assigners, or they were hardly ever or ever um, given feedback from their coordinators and assigners. So it's, again, 
the Great Lakes um, region fell about 50-50 in those two categories. Um, what's interesting, when we delved a little bit deeper into this data, we found that female officials were actually 16% more likely to, re to fall on the hardly ever or never side of that equation um, than their male counterparts. So that's, again, something that's going to be important for us as we look to the uh, strategic plan and hopefully can, can make some recommendations there. The, the sports that had the highest, before we go to this next slide, the sports that had the highest frequency of feedback were field hockey, men's and women's basketball, women's lacrosse, softball, and the sports, uh, the team sports that had the least amount of feedback were men's ice hockey, baseball, men's soccer, and women's volleyball. Um, the, the individual sports, we thought it was important to kind of break that out. Um, track and field had the most uh, performance feedback and women's gymnastics had the least of all the, um, the individual sports that had some significant numbers. So at that point, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to Sandy to talk a little bit about sportsmanship. Thank you, Mary. Uh, we're going to take just a quick look at sportsmanship and the climate of uh, officiating. We did ask numerous types of questions to get a good understanding of what officials are experiencing. This is the general question. We asked them just simply to describe sportsmanship and the treatment of officials during contests. So you can see 70% of officials said it was good or excellent uh, in Division Three, in particular in the Great Lakes region, where 30% said it was less than good, 14% neutral, and then you can see the others at less desirable and unacceptable. Um, we do have lots of data on what they think could be the most effective in changing this, as well as coach relationships, et cetera, with the officials. Um, and certainly, as you all would guess, uh, the coach's role in helping to change the trajectory in the future is going to be, going to be critical. Next, we asked officials, uh, have they experienced or witnessed any sexist or racist behavior or language directed towards officials who are women or people of color uh, in the Great Lakes region? And you can see that 78% uh, said never, but that does leave 22% that is not never. Um, both the, when we drill down by particular demographic, the women and people of color uh, were significantly more likely to have answered that they either occasionally or frequently received um, or, or witnessed um, racist or sexist behavior. And lastly, uh, we asked officials, do you feel safe physically and emotionally from arrival to departure at competition venues? In particular, in the Great Lake region, um, you can see that um, for, excuse me, 88% said that they agree or strongly agree, most strongly agree that they feel safe when they enter all the way from entering and exiting. Uh, but there were 12% that did not agree. And certainly uh, at the level of 4%, uh, not uh, completely disagreeing or strongly disagreeing. Obviously this is a uh, important issue the officials, uh, when we ask them about, we ask them two questions. One is what's most important to you in terms of your experience at a competition site and what do you, are you most likely to receive? Uh, the most disparate answer to that in terms of what they are like, they, they do desire and are less likely to receive is an escort to and from the competition site. So again, um, leads us to strategies in terms of how to improve the experience of officials and then retain, be more likely to retain them. We're gonna shift over now to our overarching, very quickly go through our, our overarching conclusions and our recommendations, and then we're gonna open it up for your questions. There were five overarching conclusions. Uh, one is officiating is in a very, operates in a very complex environment. As you all know, officials work in, uh, for different conferences. They work across um, platforms, whether that is in the high school, as, as Mary shared the slide deck there. Uh, they also, um, you know, they work in different environments. 
They also, uh, from an authority and responsibility perspective, the NCAA National Office and all of our conference offices, as well as all of you on campuses, hold responsibility for officiating. But the authority for officiating lays at the conference level. Um, so it's a very complex working environment. Secondly, as we know, the impact of aging pipeline and the lack of quality officials is evident and the research demonstrated that. Thirdly is centralized interdivisional or interconference coordination communication around really important issues like retention, like recruiting, ex like education, evaluation are limited to very few sports and very few regions. Fourthly, uh, there's a need to address the culture and the environment of officiating. And lastly, a national approach is really, frankly, the only way that's going to make systemic and cultural change, which is absolutely necessary to change the trajectory, trajectory of, offic of officiating. I'm going to shift over to then what were the recommendations as a result of the findings Number one is that there's organizational leadership and oversight for officiating. In some form or fashion, there needs to be some central oversight, accountability, and registration for officials. Secondly, is the important role that officials play in the student athlete experience must become evident. It's we have to shift and change the culture of officiating Officiating is a fundamental part of collegiate sport and it needs to be honored and respected in that way. And then thirdly is really to diversify the pool of officials. The second overarching recommendation has to do with strategic alliances. And these are all um, are necessary in terms of cross-divisional alliances, across educational alliances. So for example, the National uh, Federation of High Schools, the Junior College Association, NAIA, as well as Rec Sports. We need to have some type of, of connectivity in terms of strategic alliances. Coaches associations, uh, as mentioned earlier, coaches are a very critical part of the sporting experience. And so uh, we need to align with coaches associations to help with that particular role. And then lastly, there is certainly officials organizations as well as NGBs um, as well. So the, the third overarching recommendation has to do with conference engagement. This is specifically surrounding issues of evaluation, education and training, certainly fees and the structure of fees um, the education expectation and accountability for coordinators and assigners, and then certainly the sporting behavior has to be addressed at both a, a national, but also uh, most importantly at the conference level. So with that, our next steps and what we're fully engaged in right now is a strategic plan for officiating for Division Three. We have seven uh, conference commissioners that are representing you that are regionally selected to help advance this uh, strategic plan. So this, this group is fully engaged, meeting regularly with our small working group uh, to advance the plan based on, on the data that you've just received. So where are we in the process? Uh, it had, was initiated in August. We are deep into the process. We have a draft strategic plan. That draft is being um, rumbled about with uh, um, different stakeholders. And uh, this is, we're, we're teeing you up actually to get you ready for that process as well, which we would like for you to engage in in December. Uh, the goal is end of January, 1st of February, that we will have a final presentation of the strategic plan to the Division Three Commissioners Association. So with that, I'm gonna take a breath and uh, ask, we'll go ahead and, and open it up for, for questions and feedback. Thanks, Sandy, Carolyn, and Mary for the presentation. So if you have questions now, if you could use the raise hand feature, it'll be easy for me to call on you and, and or if you'd rather put it in chat, we can look at it that way as well. It's a quiet group today, Sandy. I think we blew everybody's minds. I do. Yes. 
say, Patrick, yeah. uh, I'm just wondering if maybe you or Carrie might want to add any reflection on as you look at it as a commissioner or the information by region, um, anything that jumped out at you or was obviously the critical issues are pretty obvious, but um, Carrie, anything from your perspective that you think was uh, a big surprise? I could just start overall with the, the, the project in general. I'll, I'll, I think the uh, administrators and, and, and folks on the call here today, we obviously knew that there were specific challenges ahead of us regarding officiating. And what the strategic, what the, the report has uh, shown is now it gives us data to support some of the assumptions we've made uh, originally and to highlight more specifically the systemic and cultural changes that we need to address moving forward. So to me, that's, that's been the most enlightening part of the first phase of the project and now going into the second phase, which is, which is the strategic plan and trying to figure out how we're gonna address that and how division three is gonna address that since we're the ones leading, leading the charge moving forward. A lot of what we're looking for is, is obviously feedback support collaboration from you all uh, in this region and obviously all the other regions as well. So I think that that's an, an important one um, uh, for us to focus on. But Carrie, you wanna address more specifically uh, the region? Yeah, so I think, um, I'm not sure that I was surprised by much um, in here. I think it was in some ways a really good way for us to have on paper what we hear anecdotally um around the region i think in certain pockets it was interesting to see the differences in sport um and see how the pipeline issues are probably a little more exacerbated than we anticipated so the length of time it takes to become an official um is a lot longer than in some sports than we thought or at least that i thought so i think that is from, from sitting in a conference perspective, that gives us some kind of concrete things to think about and how we can influence that. So at least that's from my perspective. Yeah, Carrie, I think also the, the data of the retiring age of officials and where our, our average age of officials, it gave us a much more, a clearer understanding of where the critical or the crisis is in terms of needing more officials ASAP. You know, it's, it's, we're going to be aging out a great portion of officials across the board in six years. And if it takes eight years to get an official up to speed to become an NCA official, that doesn't, the math doesn't do well for us right now. So um, I think that that's a very important part. The, um, but yeah, and, and we want to make sure from the financial side of things that we're, we're, we're making it clear that we understand, you know, resource wise, uh, where our institutions are. Um, but it was an important part of our research to understand what some of the barriers potentially are for officials uh, and how we need to address that down the road. So I just want to make sure all of the athletic directors understood that we're not saying across the board that, that, that finance is going to or money is going to fix this because it's not just about the money. It's about a, a lot of other things that are happening out there that um, need, a, need to coincide at the same time um, as we move forward. I will say one super duper helpful thing was the idea of getting feedback and how important that is to our officials because I think it helps us then talk to our coaches to say, yes, we do need you to provide feedback, positive, negative. Um, I mean, we almost never get positive, but maybe some positive um, to try and kind of get over that um, hump of I don't want to give feedback because it's going to X, right? It's going to come back at me. It's going to whatever. Um, I think if if we can say, look, this is a, a universal thing that will help improve the pool, then that's something that's really a, like an almost immediately useful piece of information. A wonderful, my wonderful colleague, Amy Backus has her hand raised. So please, Amy. Oh, thanks, Pat. I wanted to talk to Carrie's point about, about a pipeline. There are about 40% uh, of colleges and universities that still have a physical education requirement. Case Western mm -hmm. Reserve University is one of them. And we do offer a class, an officiating basketball class. And I'm wondering what uh, this group might be able to do to um, you know, encourage perhaps uh, 
classes such as that at the college level to try to engage you know, younger students um, to become involved in officiating uh, at that level. Great point, Amy. It, I, it's definitely something that we need to examine as a potential of the recruiting strategies and the potential partnerships. We do, I don't know if we have a list of the number of colleges, universities out there that are offering officiating classes out there. And that would be, a, I think, a very useful thing as we move forward from a collaboration perspective. Um, so I think it's great insight. Sandy, Mary, anything, and Carolyn, anything that, that we've done research-wise or we've seen in the, in the, in the analysis that, that sp speaks to that? I don't think it has, but it's no. something we should be tracking on. Yeah. We did not specifically ask about officiating courses or if somebody started in that way. Um, we do recognize though that there are fewer and fewer available now than there were many years ago when there was a richer pool of officials. Um, so I actually, Amy took a note about that to, um, to put that into, you know, our group of, of strategy action plan, um, you know, little file. Yeah, Sandy, uh, also not just, you know, physical education classes, but many schools offer, you know, minors in, in sport and coaching and that could fit into that, yeah. that avenue there as well. Yeah, thank you. Lori Rugsmeyer. Hey guys, first of all, thanks for letting me bust in on the, on the Great Lakes call. Um, Kind of to expound on Patrick's point, though, about um, just throwing more money at officials might not solve the problem. Admittedly, I didn't totally keep up on the data that you guys were throwing on the screen, but it seemed like some of the um, officiating groups that you said were having trouble filling contests in the Great Lakes regions weren't necessarily the ones that were most unhappy with their pay. Did you find a correlation that, that you could point to with the sports that are really having a problem and what the officials were most unhappy about in those sports? Sandy, Mary? Um, so Lori, it is interesting, much of the data correlates in, in that way. Um, where we have found uh, whether or not it's um, uh, satisfaction with compensation and retention or um, sportsmanship, for example, and um, uh, retention or, you know, different um, categories of intersection of all this data. And so we are drilling down on that process right now. And in fact, we, we did such a in fact, Mary and I joke, the ones that manage the data analysis, that we would go back and have like three questions on our survey if we ever did this again. Um, it was so comprehensive, which is fabulous, um, that we have this lot of intersecting data. So that is actually part of the strategic planning process. Um, as you'll see when we get to the, the, the um, strategic plan framework, that you'll see it's at a very high level of starting to address um, recruiting to the NCAA. How do we support and partner in the entry level recruitment? You know, um, lots of, of different ways to approach it. So the dissection of the data to that specific level is in process. I would add to that, and again, it's it's a guideline and we, we certainly are drilling down by, by region, by sport, and there's some fascinating information but the but the other point is and you saw with the, the what we want to do in the future there is no comprehensive database of officials so we we know we don't have 100 percent of the population that we reported um on this survey because we don't know what 100 percent of the population is so um that's the other challenge so we're, we we have fascinating data and we keep drilling down on it but we know it doesn't represent everyone and every, every, every sport, every region, uh, you know. So it's, uh, that's one of the challenges and that's why the recommendation of some kind of centralized um, database for everyone. So we can continue this uh, research in the future to, to have a better idea of the entire population and, and how all of this plays out. And that connected to the point that Patrick was making, um, the comprehensiveness of the data that has been collected 
demonstrated very clearly lit, that this issue is not something you can throw money at, you know, compensation and recruiting is not going to solve the problem. There are systemic and cultural issues that have to be addressed in order to bring more officials in, for them to be trained and evaluated well, and for them to you know, be retained and, and move on in the avocation of officiating. Um, so, and I, that message is abundantly clear how division three connects then to divisions two and one and uh, the importance of the entry of officiating in most sports um, in and through Division Three, So it's, it's everybody's problem, not just those people that are getting most directly impacted today. Um, Patrick, I would just simply add to that, that um, the whole concept is systemic and you noted that earlier, but um, there's not one singular factor or issue for most officials or for most, you know, for any one particular sport. But I think it's almost like uh, going back to square one and rebuilding our officiating system while at the same point having to continue to function and operate within the current system that we have. And uh, I think, you know, when you see that, tough, you know, officials talk about fees not keeping pace, it's not just the game fee. It's really the distance they have to travel, how much time's invested, what they have to do during the summer, um, whether or not they're getting training and development that really helps them advance and get better. Um, it's a complicated package, but we have to start at the key elements of the things that seem to be most obvious, and that being recruitment, getting more people in, making sure they're trained and developed in an appropriate way that really helps them get better and officiate in a quality way and then obviously keep them in the game so that we're not pushing people out because it just becomes so negative or difficult for them to continue. So it is systemic and it's, uh, it's a challenging project, but I think um, our next phase here is gonna make a difference when it gets to specific strategies and things that such as Amy's suggestion for how we can help think collaboratively about approaches and strategies that will work. I just want to address that again, Carolyn, kind of back to Amy's, Amy's question. One of the things we're trying to do with the strategic plan is, is the creation of best practices, as mentioned before. But that's, that's a best practice that we can, we can articulate a lot of the bullet points for those institutions that have those type of courses or those types of majors or whatever they may be, just to make sure we're hitting all the, all the points, like contacting your local high school um, you know, state high school association to help with certification or licensure, because uh, that's an entry point for, for new officials. So there's all kinds of best practices, not just for conferences and for conference coordinators, but obviously for intramural programs and for those, um, those institutions that do have officiating classes. Just to, and, and the people in, in teaching those classes know these things, but why not provide some, some guidance to make sure we're we're, we're getting as much bang for the buck as we can. Do we have any other questions from the group? Yeah, I, uh, just a thought. One of the uh, gold mines of our future with, with officiating are the current student athletes who are on teams. And the problem though, is that uh, too many of our coaches view officials as necessary evils. And mm -hmm. so the, the message, uh, written, unwritten, that's being sent to the student athletes is, is not a positive one. Whereas if the coaches, if we could get the coaches on board for the betterment of their sport to convey that officiating is a noble profession, and so that their student athletes, which is, there, if you want a pipeline, there it is. But uh, there could be more proactive ways that our coaches could, at the end of a season for the seniors, is maybe pass out applications uh, to their graduating seniors to sign up to be officials somehow, or to give names uh, and uh, contact information of assigners uh, in high school, uh, that, that they could go 
and and start being uh, being officials themselves. So before they leave the nest of the institution, our student athletes need to be uh, encouraged uh, to look at this as a possible profession in their future. So Tim, you just hit on a really important and critical issue. Um, so, and a great example of this systemic, we have to uh, attack this from a systemic cultural perspective and you, you nailed it. So for example, the division two has the um, player to ref program, which is fabulous, right? So, but you hit on the issue. If we don't change the culture of officiating as it relates to coaches, that's only going to move us so far, right? So do that plus. Um, so in fact, uh, one of our great commissioners guiding our, our um, research project um, made similar comments, which actually led to the official survey, which was not originally part of the study. We added that. And there were over 4,200 coaches across all 15 sports that participated in the survey. And we asked them, you know, who has the most influence on the sporting environment? And the coaches identified themselves as that, right? They know it. The officials identified who's the most important and influential. They identified the coach as most important, right? So their behavior is going to impact the environment, number one. Um, number two, when we ask them, how do you go about changing the environment? Both officials and coaches said the same thing. We need to grow appreciation for each other's role. So interesting, right? So one of the fundamental partnerships, and you'll see in the strategic plan, is partnerships with coaches associations and how to start to drive that down, as well as building best practices around what you just described in terms of an, and um, had a, a chat from Davis, actually Whitfield, who's on here with us from the National Federation of High Schools and um, it's about best practices, right? How to help people on campuses start to facilitate some of this activity too. So did we have a question, Patrick? I think, Amy, Amy, do you still have your hand up? I know you put something new in oh, the chat. No, about you. think by, you'd think by now I would know how to take my hand down after all these Zoom calls. <laughs> I, I don't mean to, you know, hog up the, the, the conversation, but also as athletic directors, I think it's incumbent on us on college campuses to not put up with the kind of behavior from, from our own coaches towards officials. I think we have to do our job to make sure that, uh, you know, that we, that we, Hold them accountable. It's appalling Thanks. sometimes. I know, I know we've, as through this process, you know, obviously in the last few years, uh, the NSA released game day, the, the D3 way. Um, and uh, I think uh, Commissioner Jones is on, who was a big part of that while he was at um, at the NCAA. We, we have been, we have gone back to them about possibly expanding that to include um, components on officiating as well. So just support concepts, as you're saying, Amy, of we need to do this across the board. It's, it can't be a singular effort. It has to be athletic directors, coaches, conference offices. Uh, we have to address the fans. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's everywhere. And to your point, I mean, it starts, your point in the, in the chat, it starts at the youth, right? The, the parents at the youth level. And uh, um, we, we've We've identified initially the National Federation of High Schools, uh, you know, that's where our, that's been a lot of our collaborative efforts right now. Um, but at some point in the strategic plan, if that, if the youth is identified as a place that we also have to address, then obviously that's where we're going to go to. Patrick, I would just add to that too, some of the other stakeholder groups of those collaborations, in addition to the Federation, High School Federation is, you know, the junior college. So, you know, NJCAA and uh, NAIA, these are all partners and all people that are trying to do the, the right thing, the same thing, but it is a pipeline of officials. And I think there's got to be a, a buy-in and added value that um, we all have a role to play to make officiating better and more robust. And, um, you know, Tim's point about, you know, yeah, it's something that should be a valued or an enjoyable profession that people come into the game thinking that this is kind of a fun thing to do and not feel as though it's an abusive environment that they're living in. So um, lots of partnerships out there, including coaches associations. 
Any last questions? We're running up, we're running up on our time limit here, um, and we do have another session to go to after this. But um, anybody else have anything they'd like to comment? You will receive information from us, like was like we said at the beginning, with a slide deck. And at that point in time, contact information will be made available. If we 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 want feedback, we need feedback. It's part of our process. And then that December meeting, the fifteenth, as we talked about. That's going to be the, the big opportunity for your stake, this group, the stakeholder engagement group of athletic administrators to give us feedback on where we are with the strategic plan at that point in time. So we're excited about hosting that. And again, special thanks to Nadia for helping us organize today's session, the other five sessions that we're doing, and then that, uh, that big one in, in December as well. So with that said, we'll just we'll give you back uh, three minutes of your day. And uh, thanks everybody for the time. Thanks again, Victor Group for another great presentation and we'll see you all soon. Take care.